Welcome everyone. Um, we're glad you're here. Uh, my name is Aaron Whedon. Um, I work for the Shodor Education Foundation. Um, we're part of the education program of EXCEED, which is the Extreme Science and Engineering Discovery Environment. And at Shodor, we also run the National Computational Science Institute. Um, and we're excited to welcome you to this webinar on computational thinking across the curriculum. Uh, before we get started into the main content of the webinar, I um, wanted to read a couple slides to you. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so Exceed has an external code of conduct, uh, which represents our commitment to providing an inclusive and harassment-free environment in all interactions, regardless of race, age, ethnicity, national origin, language, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, political views, military service, health status, or religion. And the code of conduct extends to all exceed sponsored events, services, and interactions. The code of conduct has a website at exceed.org slash code of conduct. And you can contact either myself or Dr. Bob Panoff, who um, the two of us are organizing this event. Exceed also has a number of uh, ombudspersons who you can contact. And there's also an anonymous reporting form available at exceed.org slash code of conduct. And in line with the code of conduct, Exceed is committed to providing events that foster inclusion and show respect for all. Uh, this commitment applies not only to how we interact during the event, it also applies to the training materials and the presentation. And it's not Exceed's position to use, condone, or promote offensive terminology. Um, Exceed instructors strive to keep inclusive language at the forefront. In the event that we have included inappropriate materials, either verbal or written, please let us know at terminology at exceed.org. And while Exceed has no control over external third-party documentation, we are taking steps to affect change by contacting the relevant organizations. And we hope this will be addressed by all third parties soon. So if you do see any terminology concerns in the presentation or materials today, um, we'd like to know about it. And please contact the terminology task force at terminology at exceed.org. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bob Panoff, who is going to be leading us in today's webinar. So over to you, Bob. Thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. I'll have a website that will have most of the slides that I'll be using and all the, the links. I think Aaron has also talked about putting up uh, materials that'll include collecting information in a Google Doc. So you know, you'll have to maintain a, min a minimum of notes. So this is the first of two offerings of the same basic webinar. And these are a prelude to three two-day workshops, actually two half-day workshops. So there'll be two half days in each of the workshops, one covering web and spreadsheet type modeling one covering systems modeling and one covering agent modeling. And those will take place in June. We'll give you more information about those workshops later. Our goal is to talk about computational thinking, computational science, where the verb, I'm sorry, the noun is thinking or the noun is science and computational is an adjective. Let's see, Aaron, if you can make me the host or, or co-host. I've somehow lost my co-hosting ability. There we go. So the URL for this talk is on the bottom here. What we want to talk about is computational thinking across the curriculum. And that is that if you look at the semantics that are different for physics and chemistry and biology and psychology and geology and anthropology, the underlying modeling is often the same. A classic example is that two things come together, they interact and something happens. 
a more detailed model would be two things come together, there's an interaction, and afterwards, one of the objects has now obtained a property the other object already had. I have a tree that's on fire next to a tree that's not on fire, the wind blows, and the tree that's not on fire could become a tree that's on fire. I have two people in an alley, one of which has a wallet, the other doesn't. There's an interaction, and the person without the wallet now is the person with the wallet. There's two people, one of which has the virus, the other one does not have the virus. There's an interaction, and based on probabilities, including are they wearing masks, have they been vaccinated, are they immune to the disease, the second person might now have the virus. So the thinking across the curriculum is that very similar modeling approaches, very similar mental models can be applied. And what we wanna to try to do is to talk about some of the ways those can be done. Today, I'm going to focus mostly on resources that should run on anything. I run a modeling class at Wofford College and unfortunately some kids show up with their iPhone and say, that's how they're going to do their computational work for the semester or they have an iPad with a keyboard and they think it's a computer, but they can't copy or download files to it. But today, everything's gonna to be essentially web-based or it could be web-based. I might show some examples from Excel that could be using Google Sheets, but we'll, we'll go back and forth. My intention is to spend the first part of today, the first hour talking about general concepts of computational thinking with examples from across things that involve the web, spreadsheets, quantitative reasoning, algorithmic reasoning, analogic reasoning. We'll take a short break and then come back and, and then look at a number of different examples of how you would use a web-based tool for teaching about science, about mathematics, using computation. So I often, over the last number of years, have talked about two breathing modes. One is computational science education or computational thinking in education. And the idea of this is, and this is about 70 to 80% of the uses of computing in the sciences, even in the day-to-day -day sciences. And that is that you're using existing models existing programs, existing tools, existing data to, tools to look at the content of some particular science or, or learning objective. So the computation is how something is done. We also have computational science education, which is teaching people how to build the model. How do you know if it's right? How do you understand round off and truncation, what are the ver the limits of convergence? What do you talk about resolution? What do you talk about numerical anal analysts, numerical analysis? And so as we're going through this, we're going through. Part of this entire thing is to understand the connection between the application, what you're doing, the algorithm, how you do it, and the architecture, the computing environment that you're working on. And this could be something as simple as, you know, di a digital computer such as your own hand. I mean, a typical example is if my architecture was a 10 fingered computing system and the application was to multiply by nine, the simple algorithm is you starting from the left counting over, drop a finger and read the answer. So nine times two is one, eight, 18. Nine times five would be 45. Nine times eight would be 72. So, you know, depending upon how you're doing it, you've got a match between the application, the algorithm and the architecture. Now, if you only had a nine fingered system, you might imagine that if you could use 10 fingers to multiply by nine, what do you think you could use nine fingers to do? Maybe multiply by eight. So let's try it. 
if we had a nine fingered system and we we counted over four we could do eight times four is three five 35 no three five because we have to remember it's now in base nine and three times nine is 27 plus five is 32. So if you change the application, you have to change the architecture, you have to change the algorithm. And this is also true as you're going from math in your head to pencil and paper, to a calculator, to a desktop, to a supercomputer. There are certain applications that are just right for that architecture, and there are certain algorithms that fit. There's ways to do parallel computing that are different if you have a GPU or if you don't have a GPU. So these are all some of the things that are involved with the thinking of computational thinking. Now, all of this goes into coming up with some kind of a model. And the model is where the human being comes in and thinks about things. And the model may involve the semantics, the actual words that are used, or it may be more general. But there's sort of a universal model of everything that's very important in computational thinking. And if I click on the model, this is what I call the universal theory of everything. The right answer is the wrong answer plus corrections. And a big part that's important is some of the corrections are the fact that you're doing it on a computer, that the computer itself introduces a level of approximation that might not have been there except that you're doing some of the calculations numerically and depends on resolution, truncation, and, and other, other things going on there. So what we wanna talk a little bit about is how computational thinking, and that again, for today's webinar, we're talking about using computation to enhance your thinking. We're not talking about programming. We're talking primarily about using programs that have been tested, they've been verified, they've been validated, and they're, they're, they're ready to be used to do the next thing. A lot of data science uses data tools. It does not necessarily involve direct programming. A tremendous amount of computational chemistry uses very powerful chemistry tools, but doesn't necessarily require every chemist to become a programmer. But computational thinking allows you to basically build a dynamic, interactive, and usually visual model. And this dynamic computation allows you to recompute and revisualize the model in sufficient time that you're stimulated in your thinking about it. Let me give you a simple example. This comes from the Interactivate set of materials developed by Shodor for the Department of Defense and the National Science Digital Library. So if you had been involved in some of the culture wars about whether the SAT is or isn't a good tool to determine whether someone's prepared for college level math and science, this is the a visualization of a histogram of the data. And we have 173 students whose scores have been plotted. And it's not surprising that the average is about 500 because 500 is the exact median of 200 to 800, which is the range of the scores. And everything is scaled to have an average of 500. So if your school district went from 495 to 505, it's about 500. But what's important about a histogram is that there's no theorem that says how many intervals and how wide should you make the intervals. The people that argue that the SAT is not a good test could have a wider interval and fewer of them and say, well, it's basically center peaked, even tailed continuous. You're just getting an average look at the population. And of course, some people are going to do better and some people are not going to do as better. And over kind of a fairly wide range, you can get a center peaked, even tailed continuous distribution. On the other hand, if you look at it in more detail, one of the things that you can notice is that with the same data, 
but all we're doing is increasing the number of intervals and making the intervals smaller. But computationally, we're doing it by grabbing the interval with our hand and moving it, and we can see immediately the effect of that. And what you may see jump out on your screen is that at 450, 550, 650, and 750, you have local maxima. And it turns out that under careful analysis, those bumps are persistent and are very instructive because it turns out these are really overlapping distributions and students that have a basic several years of arithmetic can solve one equation and one unknown, can solve two equations and two unknowns, or and can do that on a Saturday morning for three hours without getting tired, without dropping off in their performance. Those are not the same kids. But you never would have seen that if all you said was, here's just some data, I'm gonna make a histogram. And often in our middle school, high school, and even college level courses, people are spending all their time constructing histograms rather than interpreting them. But this is an example of a dynamic data tool. There are various environments in which you could program or build a histogram, but this for the purpose of this tool was to allow you to start out immediately and simply take the data and take a histogram and you control the various parameters to give you a, a better sense of, of what's going on in, in, the, in the system. So that's just one example, but it's, you know, the example that I, I've been using to sort of talk about what we have here. We have this, let me get back to my other screen share. We have this other coincidence in English, and that is the word representation is also the word representations. And as you saw from the histogram, as I moved the slider bar, the same data was represented and represented and represented. And eventually you come up with a representation for that data that satisfies your, your curiosity. And that's why some people have called computing as kind of a thought amplifier. It kind of takes what would otherwise be tedious and repetitious and you might be disinclined to use it and removes that and, and gives you the time and the ability to interpret the data rather than manipulate the data. So computational thinking itself looks at different things from the standpoint of authentic science and different models of inquiry. And by authentic science, I'm trying to boil it down and get rid of the mythology that everything is hypothesis driven. No, it isn't. The three basic steps of almost all science come down to expectation, observation, and reflection. Now, you could give expectation a fancy name by hypothesis, or you could, but, or you might start with the observation and then lead to reflection and then go back and do some type of expectation. But these, these are the essential building blocks of the thinking process of the person that's intending to use computation to enable them to think more clearly and to analyze and to discover things about the world around us. Now, it's an important thing to realize that expectations can actually affect observations and, and can, can therefore require some type of reflection. So let me just start with a simple example, hopefully. If I gave you the expression three plus two times six and ask you to evaluate that expression, could you in the, in the chat window sort of type in what you would expect your students would be able to evaluate that expression to be. Okay, so far the first couple of people said 15, 15, 15. 
And that, that very well be because you have an expectation that your students know a particular thing about order of operation. Now, what I'm showing you is a web version of the Microsoft Windows calculator. And when you bring up the Microsoft Windows calculator, it's in what's called standard mode. And if you were to type in three plus two times six in standard mode, you get 30, not 15. And that's because the standard they're talking about is not NCTM standards or the national science standards or some state standards. It just means like a standard checkbook calculator. Some people call it an order of entry calculator for things that are going on there. But if you were to take that same calculator and switch the mode so that instead of being the standard calculator, it was the scientific calculator, what's the first thing you notice about the science calculator? Somebody just messaged me. That's right. It has more buttons. <laughs> you suddenly have a much more complicated thing. But again, it's the same program, but with two different modes. Instead of the standard mode, this is the scientific mode and three plus two times, times six actually gives you 15. So the expectation is on a modern computer, like a Windows 10 or Windows, whatever you have, and even some calculator programs on Macs, they don't necessarily do order of operations. You'll find if you delve down deeply into the computational piece that Microsoft Excel does order of operations differently for some operations. And you have to know what to expect. And part of the computational thinking is to get our students to understand that just because they expect it, doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. And they need to be careful in their observations and reflect on it and ask themselves, what do you think is going to go on there? Let me give you another example actually using Microsoft Excel. And I'll share my Excel screen. So I'll, if you use the space bar to quickly unmute and shout out an answer and then remute, if I asked Microsoft Excel to calculate the following quantity, three six minus one six minus one six minus one six, what would you expect Microsoft would tell you the answer is? Zero. Zero. And that's what you would expect. And if you look at it, that's what it seems to be. In fact, if you ask yourself if the thing next to me really is zero, I want you to type zero. Otherwise, type not zero. And, and Excel will tell you that that's really zero. Now, if I took that expression and put the whole thing in parentheses, not the distributive law, merely encapsulating that expression in parentheses, what would you expect would be the difference between this answer and what you got before? Or do you expect there to be any difference just by putting something in parentheses? And anybody have a guess? What would you expect this to be? Should be zero. And in fact, it's not zero. This is Microsoft's way of saying, don't lie to me, because it turns out that while three sixths is exactly one half a power of two, one sixth is only approximated. One sixth is approximated. So in English, this would be exactly one half 
minus almost a sixth minus almost a sixth minus almost a sixth gives you almost zero. And it really is a different answer. It's not just a formatting stick statement of what's going on. And if you were to look at what Microsoft tells us or other programs would tell you one six is equal to, you know, of course, that there's only a finite number of bits. And so at some point, Microsoft is going to do something or whatever, whoever wrote the program is going to do something and everything else is going to be zero. Do you think it truncates or rounds? If somebody can chime in either in the chat or saying something. Is one sixth truncated or rounded when you get to the last decimal place? Anyone? Let me just ask you an easier one. What does it look like it's doing? Rounding. It looks like it's rounding, but we know that since the answer is positive, when if again, and let me go back to English, exactly one half minus more than a sixth, minus more than a sixth, minus more than a sixth should give us what kind of number? Negative. And it's in fact positive. So this is the result of a lot of consumer marketing where they looked at it and said, people expect to get a rounded number, but in fact, the number that's used in memory is truncated because this is represented as a binary number that's truncated, not a, uh, a decimal number in the way it's actually doing the calculation. So what you expect to happen isn't necessarily what happens. And in fact, depending upon how you do this, you know, you could get other anomalous results. Like for instance, if we took this and took these two six and put them together, isn't this algebraically, arithmetically the same calculation? I've got three sixths minus three sixths. But if you notice carefully, you actually get a different not zero than you got when you separated this two one third into two pieces. And this is again, part of this unexpected result that a lot of times when you're doing computation, you have to be able to handle unexpected results or unexpected performance. And it's really your expectation that has to change. Turns out often the case expectations can change observations. There was a physics psychology study done a number of years ago where they told students to verify that the period of a particular pendulum was two. And everybody in the class was able to do that, even though the lengths of the pendulums were set very carefully so that the period of the pendulum would be 1.9. But because they were expected to get two, everybody thought they were getting numbers too small. So they kept rounding up whenever they would do the measurements for the period of the pendulum. If instead the question was asked, what is the period of this pendulum? And then you, you weren't given any a priori knowledge, people were getting answers a lot closer to two. So expectations can change observations. They can also change behavior. I need somebody to volunteer to unmute and answer a simple question and perform a simple task that I'll give them. Who would like to do that? Nobody? I'll do it. Okay, that's Russ. Yeah. So Russ, I want you to count from 10 to one backwards. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Very good. Now, what did you mean by backwards? Did you mean absolutely start from 10 and count down to one? Let me ask you this, Russ. 
If I asked you to count from one to 10 backwards, what would it have sounded like? I would have been confused because I guess to me backwards means I start at the high number and go to the lower numbers. Right, but if I asked you to count from one to 10 backwards, wouldn't you have started at 10 and counted down to one? I might have just turned my around and put my back towards you and counted. That, that's a very good answer. In fact, there's lots of ways that bat backwards could be Im interpreted. You could have counted, but the way you did it, what I think you meant by backwards was exclamation point. Yes. Yes, absolutely, do 10 to one. Yeah. But somebody could have counted net, enin, tegif, nevis, sis, evif, roof, ir, out, eno, where each of the numbers from 10 to one is backwards. Or as you said, you could have turned your chair around and you were backwards while you were counting from 10 to one. Great, Thank, thanks for doing that. But the point is, is that expectations have an impact in both observations and in actions performed. And depending upon what you're expecting to happen in a particular case, you could end up with a difference in result because people had different expectations on what was sort of going on. Life experiences are also different. I often tell the story of being with my mother about ready to cross the street. And because I was born and raised in America, I was taught to do something every time before I crossed the street. And what was that? Does anybody have a life experience? What were you told before you crossed the street? What were you told to do? Look both ways. Look both ways. So I looked to the left and I looked to the right and I stepped into the street. My mother jerked me back and says, Robbie, what are you doing? And I said, I'm crossing. Didn't I tell you to look both ways? I did. Didn't you see that car coming? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the point is, is that if a three or four year old kid doesn't know the reason why they're looking both ways, because we don't teach our kids look both ways. And if you see a car coming, don't cross the street until the car is passed. You know, what we tell them is look both ways and that becomes a shorthand. You know, and it might be a biology class where you say, look in a microscope and, you know, draw a sketch of what you see, or you might be told to do something in a chemistry lab or a physics lab, or even in a computer science programming exercise. But if you don't have any, any idea why you're doing it, then the expectation is, in my case, I interpreted it years later. I had a recovered memory after one of my several surgeries, and I, I remembered this incident. And what I remembered thinking was my father taking pictures with the camera that he had and he only had. I grew up in an age where there was only one camera in the family and it was my father's and nobody better touch it. But what he always said when he was taking family pictures was if you can see the camera, the camera can see you. So I think what I was thinking was if you can see the car, the car can see you and what car is gonna hit a little kid if it sees him. Now, of course, years later, after my father died, we went through our family album and we have no pictures of my father because he was the one taking all the pictures. So anyway, that's my own life issue there. But but people bring come come to to school with their life experiences and not everybody has the same life experience for things that are going on and, and for what they're doing. So we have this idea of expectation, observation, and reflection. And then we also talk about different models of inquiry. Now, if I wanted to, I could expand verbally expectation, observation, and reflection. And I have a PDF that I've linked to that you all can download if you want. And that is reformulating the scientific method in the, in the spirit of inquiry-based learning. That is asking more questions rather than making more directions for what people do. So what can you observe? What do you observe? 
what's observable with or without help? Are the observations accurately recorded and honestly reported? And then the difference between concluding something and saying something that's consistent with the observations. You may not be able to conclude anything. Science is not like mathematics that has a number of theorems. I mean, it turns out that, you know, with, without what you have is data and then descriptions of those and, and conclusions that are basically consistent with the observations, but it may not be the, the final be all explanation of what's going on. So you might wanna take a look at that at, at some point. Now, in terms of types of inquiry, I wanna spend a few minutes generally thinking about what students consider inquiry is, I'm gonna to go to Google and look it up. So there's some un, unexpected parts of Google that you may not know about. We'll talk a little bit about that. So if I go to Google, there's sort of enough Easter eggs to do things. One of which is if I come over here and type in a skew, I don't know if you notice the entire page is a skew, but I'm gonna type in three plus two times six. And instead of only giving us one of the 25 trillion pages that have the numbers three, two, and six on it, you actually get back a calculator. And you get something from the calculator that you that I didn't type in. Can you see that what you get is the two times six is in parentheses, which mm -hmm. communicates, Ada, what does it communicate? Just the grouping. Yep, the order of operations. Yeah, order of operations. And that's why you get 15. But you notice you also get this, cal this calculator. Yeah. Now, a lot of times when you're in class and you say to people, I want you to type in three plus two times six, they might actually type that out in English, not knowing you wanted them to type it out as numbers. Good news, Google knows how to interpret words that are actually used to represent numbers and may end up doing that calculation for you anyway. Now, if you did this years ago in Rome and you used Roman numerals and you said three plus two times six, what do you think you're gonna get? You get X, XV, which is 15 in Roman numerals. In Roman numbers. There you go. Now there's other things that are kind of buried in Google. For instance, you can flip a coin. And if you flip a coin, you can, it, it's not very fast, but if all you're trying to do is flip a coin, we got heads, then heads, then tails, then tails. So it's not at least alternating, but, you, but this is a very slow way to go about trying to figure out how you would get enough heads or tails to figure out if it was fair or even again. You can also roll dice, pull up a calculator. There's a built-in spinner, there's a metronome, there, there's a number of tools that are in there. But there's something else that I wanna talk about for a couple of minutes, which is called information algebra. There's a lot of information right now about Mars in the news because several countries have rovers that are up there. We have the helicopter that's going up and down and things like that. And somebody might be in, interested in answering the question, which planet has a larger mass, Earth or Mars? And if there's a physics or earth science person on the webinar, do you, do you, can you remind us which one you think is bigger? The mass of the earth or the mass of Mars? Well, I know this is a hard thing to be interactive. So I'll just say, well, we could figure it out 
by doing a simple calculation. If we type, if we took the mass of the Earth and divided it by the mass of Mars, if that ratio was greater than one, then Earth would have the bigger mass. And if that ratio was less than one, then Mars would have the bigger mass. But if I wanted to do that calculation, what would I need to know to calculate the ratio of the mass of the Earth to the mass of Mars? If somebody can unmute briefly and share their- You would need to know the mass, you would need to know the mass of each one, right, before you start? You would think so, but it turns out what you need to know is how to type. Because if I, if I type in mass of the Earth divided by the mass of Mars, I misspelled mass. Mm -hmm. Google goes somewhere into the deep dark recesses of the universe, pulls up the mass of the Earth, pulls up the mass of Mars, does the division and tells us the answer. But the question is, how do you know if it's right? Okay. If you don't know the mass of the Earth, if you don't know the mass of Mars, you're putting a lot of trust in Google to just simply give you an answer and, and trust it. Now, this is why I think as part of computational thinking, quantitative thinking, numerical thinking, if we just looked up the mass of Mars, it would shout at us that the mass of Mars is 6.39 times 10 to the 23 kilograms. And if you look to the right, you'll see that it'll tell you where it got that number. And is anybody disappointed? Where, where does it get this number? Wikipedia. Now, if you click on Wikipedia and, and go down, and, and look at the mass, it's not 6.39 according to Wikipedia, it's 6.417. And they even have a footnote, which unfortunately doesn't include the mass of Mars, but it takes you to something that does, which is the Mars fact sheet. And if we remember 6.471, according to NASA, the number is 6.418 not 6.417. So depending upon how you're doing this, you either get one of three different answers, you know, 6.417, 6.418, or the original number 6.39. So one of the things that it's important for computational thinking is that if you have data, it's only as good as the numbers you put into your model or into your simulation. And if you're getting those from Google, you have to be willing to insist that you ask your students and that they be able to answer, how do you know if it's right? Now, what I was talking about information algebra, we were talking about what if you wanted to calculate the mass of the earth? We wanted to calculate the mass of the Earth, we would have to use some kind of a model. And that model makes some pretty important assumptions, one of which it assumes that, that the Earth is a perfect sphere that has a certain radius. And if we said that we could do a simple experiment, we take a falling object near the surface of the Earth, and it's equal to big G, which is a constant that makes all the units come out right, times the mass of the Earth times the mass of whatever's falling. Let's say I want to do the my pen that's falling, divided by the radius of the Earth squared. Then we could multiply up by R squared, divide by G, and use that to quote unquote calculate the mass of the earth. Now that's a, that's a good example for where we could use information algebra. We could say 
that this is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared times the radius of the earth squared and then divide that by the gravitational constant. And Bob, we can't see what you're typing ah. at the moment. Okay, so let me figure out why it's not sharing the rights. I clicked on the wrong version. Okay. And I have to raise this to the power squared. And you get the number you may remember you saw before, which is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. So what you're, and it tells you that it's in kilograms because we gave the gravitational constant 9.8 meters per second squared. The radius of the earth, it used the, the appropriate units. The gravitational constant, it used the appropriate units. So the point is, is that Google in a computational thinking world has become a kind of information calculator for a lot of people. And if they don't have the time to both look something up and do the calculation, you still need to ask the question, how do you know if it's right? And if your students are not able to do that, you know, we're not, we need to help them, right? Because that's part of the learning, the learning curve, the learning exercise that's, that's going on there. All right, so there, there's different things that can happen in open inquiry. With, with Google and things like that. Now there's other types of inquiry that I will often call seeded inquiry. And this one is an, a good one to use for showing the wonder of the world of mathematics. One of the earliest web-based applications that was created shortly after the web was created while I was still at the University of Illinois was called the fractal microscope. And the basic idea of the fractal microscope is to take a look at what's called the Mandelbrot set. And the Mandelbrot set is a series of points that are assigned a color based on this iterated calculation. You start with the point in the XY plane, a complex number, square it, add the original number. And if you do that over and over and over, if the value ever gets to be greater than two, you give it a color that's proportionate to the number of times it took to exceed the number two. And if it never exceeds the number two, you give it a base color. Oftentimes people use a dark color to make it stand out distinctly from that. So if we were to switch and go back to our screen here, just to talk a little bit about what we're doing, if we had the number zero, if we had zero times zero is zero, plus zero times zero plus zero times zero, it, it never gets bigger. If we had the number one, we could have one times one, which is one plus one, which is two. And then you take that number and square it, times two times two is four, then you add the original number, now you're at five. Five times five is 25, plus one is 26. And your answer is greater than two and never comes back. So the number one is not in the Mandelbrot set and it would be given a color, but the number zero would be colored by your base dark color, whatever your background color is. On the other hand, the number minus two Minus two times minus two is four. If you add minus two, you get two. 
If you multiply it by two, you get four. If you add minus two, you get two. So the number minus two is in the Mandelbrot set. And the point is that the, what else is in there? Well, it turns out that the amazement is that most of arithmetic could be discovered usually with the help of someone pointing this out. We've had a few people independently discover this, but it's based on the symmetry numbers that are kind of in here. It turns out that everything, if you think of this as kind of a, a, a blob with two arms, and this is the head blob, and you'll notice that the arm blob has a head blob and two arms, and every main blob has a head blob and two arms. The one up here has two things coming out, one going up, one going down. And this is characterized by the orbit number or how many times does this thing repeat before coming back with the number two. Now, if I was to ask you to, to shout out an integer that you think of when you see this intersection, what integer comes to mind when you see these things coming together? Three. Three. Now, if I go back and if I take the largest blob in between two and three, that's this one here. And how many spikes are coming together out of the head of the largest blob in between two and three? So five. Good. So see if you can use that to predict how many spikes do you think would be coming out of the head of the largest blob in between three and five? And it turns out that it's eight. And you could come up with the blob theorem, which is that the sum of the spikes on any two blobs is equal to the largest, the number of spikes in the largest intermediate blob. And so you're, you're coming up here with sort of being able to discover that the Mandelbrot set has the ability of doing all of integer arithmetic. It also turns out if we were to spend more time on this, you could do all of integer multiplication as well. But these are things that would not have been possible without substantial computing. I mean, Mandelbrot in his original paper talked about the fact that a lot of the work had been done in the 1800s, but they were not able to do the math because there was so much of it. This particular image is 90,000 pixels, each one of which is iterated 140 times. And that's not something you're gonna do with a hand calculator or pencil and paper. And even in 1994, before we put this on the supercomputer, on the desktop computers at the time, it would take four or five hours to calculate one of these images once. And as soon as we could get it on a machine capable of doing 100 million calculations a second, then it was almost interactive. And we'll and then we could use different color palettes. And we could do different types of scaling. But a big part of this going on is that the computation can implement a tedious repetitious algorithm that as long as it was programmed correctly by somebody, everyone else gets to use it. And so the fractal microscope, a lot of the models, a lot of the simulations, a lot of the things that we're doing are all based on this ability to sort of go in, discover a useful tool, being able to use that useful tool, and then come out of that with, with some kind of particular learning objective. Now, 
there are other types of things that could be done. And we'll spend a lot more of this in several weeks when we do the workshop on agent modeling. But I just want to show you sort of this basic idea as we're going through with rabbits and wolves and, and other things. So with rabbits and wolves, this is an example of an agent-based model where you may not be able to see it as clearly, but the wolves have white tufts on their ears and on their head and the rabbits have a powdery tail. And the basic story is, is that wolves eat rabbits, rabbits eat wolves, I'm sorry, rabbits eat grass, everybody gets old and dies. And if I stop it here, what do you notice about the number of rabbits in the vicinity where there's a large number of wolves? Hopefully you would notice that there aren't that many rabbits. And where there's lots of rabbits, there's not a lot of grass. And if we kind of resume the simulation, as things are going through, We could take a look at a graph. This is a different representation. And the grass is growing, the rabbits are populating, the wolves are populating. But as you get more, let's see, do you see the graph, Aaron? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure the pop-up windows are shared when the main page is shared. So as the rabbits goes up, the grass goes down. As the rabbits go up, the wolves go up. With more wolves and less grass, the rabbits start going down. And when the rabbits go down, the wolves die off by starvation exponentially. And the grass grows linearly until it fills the entire plain. One of the advantages of simulations is that I could reset the simulation and run it over and again. And I could study what would otherwise take in nature years or decades, I can do that in a simulation. I can also study different effects of the simulation. So in this particular case, I could change the size of the forest. And with a much bigger forest, the average distance between rabbits and wolves can be affected. And you can see the wolves are clearing out the rabbits but the rabbits have enough stamina to come back. And if you look at the population graph, you can see that now you're getting a, a cyclic behavior. So you might argue that this could be used to justify a type of ecological decision. Why do we have national parks? Why do we have park reserves? Why do we have the Great Smoky Mountains Reserve? Why do we have the Washington National Forest, the Jefferson National Forest? It's because with large area reserved for nature, we get greater species diversity maintained. Where in a smaller space, you wouldn't necessarily get that. But that's the kind of stuff that it would take some expertise. You couldn't simply go to the web pull down a model and run it and be able to tell what's really going on. How does it work? How does it happen? The advantage of these kinds of models that are out there from most of the science agencies, from a lot of universities, from places like Shodor, is that the model and a lot of the lesson plans and resources already exist. And you don't need to sort of create those and you can stimulate the thinking a lot more directly. This is a good place to take a five minute or so break. Uh, let's make it or so. So it will come back in seven minutes at 2.07 and we'll talk about the related properties of computational thinking, quantitative reasoning, algorithmic thinking and analogic thinking. Okay, let's get back here. Before we start, I'll ask if there are any questions, comments, or concerns. 
from what we did in the first hour? Okay, if there are none, the plan is to go for one more hour of content and then I'll be available for the following third hour for any particular questions that you might have or any specific applications you might be interested in or any particular uh, modeling tools or, or anything else that I can show you. We can do it much more hands-on and more in depth depending on who has what questions for that. Okay, so picking up, what I wanna talk a little bit about is the types of thinking that go in. And again, ultimately this is to make the best use of computation in your thinking and to make use the best use of computation. And then eventually to get into the modeling where we're actually gonna not just run models or modify parameters, but in the workshops we'll be covering, we'll actually talk about some of the details of using different modeling environments to understand particular modeling cases where simulation and modeling are important parts of chemistry, physics, mathematics, biology, psychology, et cetera. So the first thing to talk a little bit about is quantitative reasoning. And again, this basically goes back to representation versus representation. And so what I'd like to do is to get this to be as interactive as possible, feel free to push down on your space bar, give an answer and then let go. Uh, and everybody can chime in, give everybody a chance to chime in. But the question, or the challenge I have for you is to change the sound of education so that instead of asking only and being satisfied only by knowing the answer to this question, what we're really looking at is process. How many different ways are there for us to solve a problem? And if I was to ask the question, what is the sum of the first 10 integers? How many different ways can you think of to solve that? Who has one way that you could solve that? Well, you could just, of course, start with one plus two and then add three to that and then add four. So kind of linearly. Right. And that would be a good way to do it. Definitely an algorithm that works. One plus two is three, six, 10, 15, 21, 28, uh, 36, 45, 55. You would get 55. Absolutely. Does anyone have another way of, of doing that? What if you added one plus 10, what would you get? Two oh. plus nine, three plus eight, four plus seven, five plus six. What does each of those pairings give you? 11. And what's five times 11? 55. 55. Now, some people have trouble dealing with 11. So if we, I'm going to change the color to blue. What if we did one plus nine, two plus eight, three plus seven, four plus six? What do you end up having? And don't forget the 10 that's already out there. Well, you've got five groups of 10 plus the five that we didn't pair with anybody. And that gives us 55. So there's lots of ways to get 55. And depending upon how you do them, some of them will be more amenable down the road for parallel computing. Some of them will be easier to check. Some of them would be less scary. And of course, if you remember your combinatorics, n times n minus one over two, n plus one over two. 
So if n is 10, this could be 10 times 11 divided by two, which would be five times 11, which would be 55. So there's lots of ways to get that. All of them give you the right answer. All of them are verified, meaning you know that they're right and they're valid. They're good ways to do it. And that's opposed to other cases where people may have an alternative way of doing something, but it's not necessarily the best way to do it. If I was to ask you all collectively, and you can answer individually, if I wanted to reduce the fraction 16 over 64 to lowest terms, what is 16 over 64 in lowest terms? Anyone? It's one fourth. And how did you get it? What was your method? I guess I just guessed 16 went into 64 and so got four and so that's what I did. Right. And Billy, who's sitting in the back of the room and watched the teacher reduce fractions by scratching something out in the numerator and scratching something in the denominator, says, well, why don't you just cancel the sixes? And of course, if Billy did that, he would end up getting 61 fourth as well. But is that a valid way to do the, the, the arithmetic? Obviously not. So, you, you know, you're sort of left with this thing that there's multiple ways of going about doing this, but not all of them are right. They may give you the same answer, but that's getting the right answer isn't, it's necessary, but not sufficient to validate a method that you get the right answer. Remember the right answer is the wrong answer plus corrections. And a lot of times you're gonna to have to make a lot of corrections if the method isn't even very good at all. Now, one of the things I like to emphasize with my students is we often use similar symbols, but things could mean something very differently. And when we talk about algorithmic thinking, there are lots of cases in physics and chemistry and biology in which one thing is equal to the product of two other things. But what a physicist typically means by e by this double line or a chemist, and again, this is my opinion. When a physicist looks at F equals MA, that's not just take a number and multiply it by any two numbers. It's stating that a force causes a mass to accelerate. If I divide the force by the mass, a force acting on a mass causes it to accelerate. And frequently, at least in classical physics, this equal sign stands for causality. In chemistry, at least from my experience as a physicist, the equal sign means conservation of energy, that the units of NRT are energy, the units of PV are, en are energy. Pressure is a force per unit area if I multiply a force per unit area times the volume, the volume would be length times area, the areas cancel, and you would get a force times the length, which is the units of work. So what this equals means is essentially conservation of energy. If I measure the energy one way, I get the same answer as if I measure the energy another way. And in biology, oftentimes when you're building models, you could say rabbits are changing over time because some of the rabbits, a fraction of the rabbits are having bunnies. So you could have an equation which tells you two things are equal on both sides and that's all you mean by this. It could be a formula which means that what you're trying to do is to solve for the unknown. You have a formula to do that, or it could be the beginning of having an actual model. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Now, at the very beginning, we talked about computational thinking 
as being something that supports different analogies that are independent, independent of their semantics. So for instance, here are four analogies that are used across many sciences. The first one being what you have is equal to what you had plus what changed. Now, what do I mean by that? If you go through and look at your basic sciences, there's lots of things that have this particular way of looking at the world of what you have is equal to what you had plus what changed. If you're doing physics, where you are is equal to where you were plus how far you moved. How fast you're going is equal to how fast you were going plus how much you've accelerated. If you're doing economics, the money you have in your bank account now is the money you had plus what you put in minus what you took out, the net being the change. If you're doing rabbits like we did before, the number of rabbits that you have is equal to the number of rabbits that you had plus the rabbits that increase minus the rabbits that decreased. And you might have lots of reasons why rabbits increase and decrease. Rabbits could be born, rabbits could hop in from somewhere else, rabbits could die, rabbits could be eaten by wolves, rabbits could hop away. The number of healthy people that you have is equal to the number of healthy people you had minus the ones that got sick, minus the ones that died. Over the last year, we've done a lot of pandemic modeling in the classes I've been dealing with. And again, ultimately it comes, comes down to what you have is equal to what you had plus what changed. Let's take the example that I just did from biology, which if I said that rabbits are changing over time because a fraction of the rabbits are having bunnies. In any given time, each rabbit has B bunnies. Now, if you just read this off as the letters, you're not doing your students a very good service. But if you actually start telling stories, one of the things scientists like to do a lot is rabbits are changing over time because a fraction of the rabbits are having bunnies. Now, if I multiply up by delta T, and if I expand out the new rabbits minus the old rabbits, give you the change in the rabbits, then I can move this over to the other side. And the rabbits that you have are equal to the rabbits that you had plus the change in the number of rabbits, right? So even though we're not doing differential equations, we can easily do difference equations as iterated arithmetic. And something we'll cover much more detail in the workshop using spreadsheets, but I'll use it as an example today, is a simple population model, which if you want to download it for yourself, you can do it by just clicking on the link, what you have is equal to what you had. And that'll give you Let me see if I can, I've got to unshare my, my window here and reshare it. Okay, so I'm gonna unshare my Google window and reshare my Excel window. Now, all I've done here is on the left, I've just typed in text to show you how I got from the difference equation to the what you have is equal to what you had plus what changed version of it. 
And then I used a feature of Excel where I can name individual cells or individual columns so I can refer to things exactly as they are so that the formula is no longer using dollar signs and numbers, but is using the variable names as it appears. And if you were to keep making more bunnies, then you would have exponential bunnies. Now you could put you, we could have put in any model for this, and it just depends on what you have is equal to what you had plus what changed. So in this case, what's in the parentheses times dt is what's changing. So we could have just as easily put in a carrying capacity model here and multiply this by one minus the old number of rabbits divided by R max. And if we do that, then we get a carrying capacity model and the number of rabbits actually flattens out. Or we could do a competition model or we could do competition and carrying capacity. But the point is, is that one of the things we'll show in a few weeks when we do the workshop on spreadsheets is that spreadsheets are a very good way to get the kids thinking about what really is the algorithm so that when they do go and try to program something, they'll be able to understand the concept before they actually have to understand the programming. The analogy I use again from my own upbringing was before we could play a band instrument, my parents required us to take two years of piano. And we said, what does piano have to do with a band instrument? You don't march with the piano. But without them realizing it, when we started taking band, we had already known how to transpose scales. We already know how to read music. We already knew what the notes were. And all we were doing was learning how to play an instrument where every other kid in our class was learning how to read music and learning how to read an instrument at the same time. So in this case, the computational thinking precedes the programming skills because they've already learned the programming concepts. So we'll, we'll come back here and talk about some of these other. Now, again, I'm gonna use Excel to do the thinking, but a tremendous amount of the world is modeled by the statement, I am the average of my neighbors. So two things, you know, <coughs> thermal is, <coughs> excuse me, thermal properties are spreading diffusion, the amount of salt. I mean, the, the model I'm gonna show you is actually something we use with the project where they recovered Blackbeard's boat. And a lot of the wood had been soaking in salt water for years, hundreds of years, and they leached it with pure water. And the question was, how long does it take this to actually happen? But I'm gonna use a thermal analogy to show you the basic idea of the computational thinking that would go into writing a program you don't have to write a program, you just have to build the model in a constructive way. And so I'm downloading something called salt diffusion. And I'll reshare the Excel window. Now I need to point out that I've done something and if you run it on your machine, you'll have the same thing under preferences or options. I've already changed the calculation from automatic to manual. And that's to avoid what are called circular references. I'm also using iterative calculations of one step at a time. In, in this particular case, 
if you're doing it and you're doing manual calculations on a Mac, you would hit con command equals on a PC, you hit F9. But when things spread, they usually average out. And the goal of the computational thinker is to get the description of the problem absolutely correct once and then let the computer do the tedious repetitious part. So for instance, imagine you had a, a classroom trailer outside in the cold of winter and the designers of the trailer put all the heaters on one side of the room. How long would it take the whole trailer to heat up if an, in a poorly insulated case, everything, all the other three walls were exposed to the outside wor world? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to literally put in, if I add up my four neighbors to the right, below me, to my left, and above me, and divide by four, it shouldn't surprise you that if you hang around with a bunch of nothings, you'll end up with nothing. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to add something that helps us think which is a visualization in which using the numbers, number, 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 and using blue for cold and red for hot. Oops, too fast. I didn't wanna hit okay, I wanted to hit this bar here. And I wanna go up to, let's say a hundred degrees centigrade and we'll do it logarithmically. That when the temperature in the trailer is very cold at zero degrees Celsius, the color will represent blue. And if I was to make this a higher number, it would end up being closer to red. But now that I've done that, I'm gonna take the one cell, copy it down and copy it over. And every cell is relative to every other cell. Now I'm going to put the, I'm gonna turn on the heaters on the outside world. And if somebody could mass, Un unmute themselves and describe roughly how do you think this heat's going to travel left to right on your screen? What's going to happen to the heat that starts at the heater and goes into the cold room? And while you're thinking, I'm going to actually hold down the command key and hold down equals, and I'm going to iterate this over and over and over. And again, given the geometry of this room, this particular orientation of heater isn't going to effectively heat up the entire room because the cold air is still coming in from the outside. But the idea of doing hundreds or thousands of calculations iteratively over and over and back and forth, this is sort of what makes the computation thinking. All we had to do was get the equation right once. When we figured out how to average once, that's all it took. And then we could turn the heaters off. And you'll notice the cold comes in from the outside and the middle of the room stays warmest the longest and eventually everything washes out. But again, there's lots of things that spread like that. If, if I left the cap off my pen, the stain that would spread on my shirt would spread by diffusion. You know, th there's all kinds of things that are happening that way. Another type of modeling, another type of thinking, another type of analogy is one I started with, which is two things come together, something happens, and one of the objects acquires a property the other one already had. 
An example of that could be something like the pandemic. People walking around, there was a certain probability that if they interacted, they could spread the disease. You could lower the probability by keeping a distance. You could lower the probability by wearing a mask, but it doesn't eliminate the probability. That's why some people politically got all of, oh, it doesn't eliminate it. Well, it's not gonna eliminate it, but it reduces the probability. Same thing, the vaccine doesn't necessarily prevent you from getting the disease. Most of the vaccines prevent you from getting the serious consequences of the disease if you happen to get the disease. But it does in fact lower the probability of spreading the disease. But, it, but it's not 100%. I'm sure you've heard the news it's 85, 90, 95%. That's not 100%. So in, in terms of where we're going with this, I wanna show you an example of a, of a type of programming called agent modeling, in which you basically, instead of drawing a picture, you tell a story And here's the basic story of a very, very, very simple disease model. In fact, I wrote it out already. If a healthy person is next to any sick person, with some chance they change into a sick person. A sick person after sufficient time has a chance to get better. Both healthy and sick persons move randomly in the world, but sick persons move slower. That's the model. Now, the computational thinking is in the model. It's in this verbal description because the National Science Foundation has funded the development of middleware that if you can take a story in English with nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs, then you can turn that into a dynamic visual and interactive model very, very quickly without really programming, even though you are programming, it just doesn't look like programming. So here's, here's the model. Let me make it so. So in this case, I have different persons. The blue square is a healthy person. The green square is a sick person and the red plus is somebody who sits in the corner and counts and graphs. So it says, if I see that I'm a blue person, which is healthy, and I'm next to any green person, so that means a healthy person is next to a sick person, there's a percent chance that I change into a sick person. Well, that was our story. If a healthy person is next to a sick person, there's a chance they change into a sick person. Now, what if they're not next to a sick person? Well, then they just move randomly on the red background. What if they're a green person, they're sick already? Well, if their clock is greater than or equal to 25 time steps, there's a 50% chance that they change back into somebody that's healthy. Okay, I, I didn't mean to click on something to actually do that. If I'm green, there's a 10% chance that I move randomly, in which case my clock increases by one time unit. If I don't move, my sick clock increases by two time units, which is to simulate if you rest, you'll get better faster. And then the only thing the Red Cross person does in this model is count the number of healthy, count the number of sick and make a graph. So here's our sick person, here's a healthy person. And if I run the model, all the sick people got better. So let me re rerun it. So now they're getting sick. They're getting sick again. The number of sick is gradually increasing. The number of healthy is gradually decreasing. 
Now, some of the sick people are getting better, so the number of sick can actually decrease. And I can show the simulation properties. I have an infection rate. I can adjust this dynamically. I can make people get sick faster. I can make it so that nobody gets sick anymore. And that means all the healthy people, all the sick people will eventually get better. But the entire model is the story that I told as retold in these Rebus tiles. If, then, that's all part of the structure. And then you tell the story with these little tiles and the story matches the story that we had to begin with. And it doesn't have to be healthy sick. It could be people telling a rumor. It could be people learning a language. It could be people selling particular goods. You have buyers and sellers. But once you have your model, then those are the things that can come out there. We'll do this in the third of the workshops. We'll study types of agent models that you can use for things like that. And the last type of thinking I want to talk about is the ability of use a computer simulation to check somebody's assertion And this will be sort of our, our game of chance here. A couple uh, about 10 years ago, there was a congressman that was very mad at federal workers. And the reason he was very mad at federal workers, let me see if I can. Can you see this story here? Here was his gripe. His gripe was that he thought federal workers were cheating by being absent on the Tuesdays following a Monday holiday. And his argument was that 27% of the sick leave was taken on a Tuesday if Monday was a holiday over a two year period. And 24% of all sick leave was always taken on a Monday. Now, does anybody see anything wrong with that type of statistical reasoning? Why would you object if, if there were weeks in which there was a Monday holiday, why would you object to there being 27% of the absenteeism was on the Tuesday? for that particular week. What would you expect it to be if the world was perfect statistically? Anyone? Well, let's assume that if you had Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in no particular order, you just had four other days of the week over a two year period, there are approximately eight federal holidays. Well, I think some years have nine, so we'll make it 18 data points. If we had 18 data points and we wanna say, which day of the week had the most number of absenteeism, and we did that 18 times, while you expected 25%, 25%, in fact, one day would have had 28% and another day would have had 33%. If you did it again, one day would actually have 33% and two of the days would have 28%. If you did it again, and by the way, this is using a research quality random number generator. So if you did this over and over for the other four days of the week, you're always gonna get one or more of the days of the week to have more than 25% absenteeism. 
So the fact that you only got 20, 27% is actually to me rather striking. And if you had five days of the week and his argument was that too many people were taking Monday off, even if it wasn't a federal holiday, so that you know, if you had um, 84 weeks of the year, then is there ever the case that you would get more than 20%? And the answer is yes, here's one way. On one day, you would have gotten 24%, which is exactly his argument. If you did it again, you would get one with 27%, another with 23% if you did it again. So part of the reason is statistics are not pure and theoretical. And the second is you have such a small number of data points that you, you don't really have an argument to be made. And he spent thousands of dollars on federal hearings trying to make his point that people get sick at random. Years ago, one of the major car companies in Detroit sued the union because they found out that in a five-day work week, believe it or not, 40% of the absenteeism was on either a Monday or a Friday. That's right, two out of five days counted for 40% of the absenteeism, which is what you would expect, but not what humans expect. A number of years ago, we sent some of our students up to the mall with a math questionnaire. And one of the questions on the questionnaire they would stop people and ask them is, is two fifths a large number or a small number? And about 80% of the respondents said that two fifths was a small number. And then later after several other distracting questions, we asked them, is 80% a large number? I'm sorry, is 40% a large number or a small number? And a, just under 80% of the people said that 40% was a large number. So they thought two fifths was a small number, but 40% was a large number when in fact they're the same thing. But again, multiple representations can be represented differently and they have to be represented to be able to be understood as to what's going on. So are there any questions on the basic ideas we've been talk talking about with the different types of anal analogic reasoning. Now, what I wanna kind of talk a little bit here is some of the tools that we've used to help people understand basic mathematics to, to build up their computational thinking. An example of this would be the, the famous, you know, if you're doing y equals mx plus b and you get a straight line, what, what's the difference between the m? What does it change in the formula and the b? So I don't know if, you know, we call this first variable in English, the slope, even though it begins with the letter M for some reason. Does anyone know the reason why it begins with the letter M? It comes from the French monter, which means to climb. If you're a mountain climber and you start at your B, your base camp, and you're going up the mountain at a certain rate, M is the rate of climb, which in English we call the slope. I've had one student who said, no, she remembered it because the M is the multiplier and the B is the base. However you wanna remember it, the point is that as you increase, 
the value of m, the linear function is steeper. And as you decrease it, the linear function is more negative and steeper. Now here's something visually. If you wanted to know or be able to ask the question, for all the lines with the same slope, but different intercepts, how are they related to each other? And what I'm doing by showing the trace is I'm not erasing the old position when I draw the new position. How are these curves related to each other? Do you see that they're parallel? And that's something that our students reported they could see in later when they were tested and asked, what would you have to show to prove that two lines are parallel of the majority of that, that sixth grade class could tell you that they would have to have the same slope. And that was a much better result than when they were just drawing pictures on a marker board or a chalkboard. Now, if you were to take some other function, do you remember the rabbits that had sort of the, in the large forest, we had a, a, a curve that went up and down for the rabbits and the grass and the wolves, if we had a large enough forest. If you wanted to figure out how to model that, you could talk this out here as one, some number times the cosine of a second parameter I'm calling B times the quantity X minus C plus D. And each of those parameters changes one physical characteristic of the curve. What's out front, which is using the letter A, changes the amplitude. What multiplies the argument changes the frequency. It tells you how frequently you get another bump. What is subtracted from the independent variable moves the curve left or right. And the additive offset just takes whatever curve you have and adds something to it or subtracts something from it. So you have the sense of using a computational tool that's doing millions of operations a second to replace staring at page 47 in your book that says, as you can see from the graph, when in fact, it's my experience that I couldn't see it from the graph. But these are the types of tools that have been developed over time that you can build. You could write a program that would have this functionality, but you can also use a tool that's computational and built. And in this particular case, I'll use this to kind of sum up what we've been doing, has materials for the instructor, including lesson plans and standards help files to figure out how to do particular things for each activity, the activity itself, and questions for the learner to help them understand what's going on. So you can type, you know, if you had some other function you wanted, you know, you might have what some people call the zit function, a times the exponential of the quantity minus B times X B times X, the quantity squared plus C. So if you had something like this, this is a Gaussian. One of my students refers to this as a zit function. I found out that that's a trigger term that people with acne will be offended if you call it the zit function. So let's call it the Gaussian. But you can affect the amplitude of the Gaussian. You can affect how wide the Gaussian is. 
or you can move the Gaussian up or down. If I come back over here, I could not only move it up and down, I could make it wider or narrower. I could move it left or right, or I can move it from my forehead to my chin. But the idea of we're using a computational tool to help students get a better mathematical understanding so they don't need the tool. Event, you're, you're training them to sort of look at the world and say, how can I understand this better? What mathematical description would I need to know? What does a linear function do? What does a quadratic function do? What does a Gaussian do? What does an exponential do? What does a logistic do? And we're using these tools to help people understand the mathematical nature of the world from a dynamic visual and interactive point of view. The other thing that we, we can do is, of course, we can sort of make assumptions of things of how they fit to data. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next. So the last two things I'll, I'll show you are sort of more complete science exploration environments. Um, we've already talked a little bit about the disease model, but computationally, one of the hardest things to deal with are what are called end body problems, where you have a large number of objects. And this is basically a physics force equals mass times acceleration problem. But the difference is, I've got 512 objects acting in three dimensions with three positions each, three velocities each, three accelerations each. So you're basically doing thousands of coupled differential equations at the same time. In this particular exploration, it's particularly well suited to answer the question, why are some galaxies look like globular clusters and why are some flat spirals? What's the initial formation that gave rise to that? So if we started out with a bunch of objects that are gravitationally significant, they're very massive. Each mass has the mass of 400 stars, 400 suns. Then the question is, what will this particular object end up doing? The first thing that you may notice is I can do something I could never do in a telescope, which is to rotate the entire galaxy. What you may be seeing is what's called gravitational infall, where fairly uniformly in all directions, gravity is pulling everything in towards the center. As things pull into the center, they're not actually aimed directly at the center. So you're not going to get a, a black hole collapse in this particular classical gravitational model. You've seen it's taken almost 600 million years for this to get to this point. It takes about a billion years for you to get the full infall and slingshot effect. And as everything's now in a very dense, tight space, you then start seeing some of them are going to be slingshot and sort of thrown out. And while we're doing that, we'll go to images. And do globular clusters. And you can see what a globular cluster looks like. And you can see what our particular simulation of a perfect 
not perfect, a statistically spherical initial condition with no rotation and you let go of the stars and they fall in and when they pop out, you get something that reminds you visually of the globular cluster. Now, if we had started that with rotation and then got that going, I'm gonna put on a trace for a little bit. I don't know if you can tell that you're actually, you're looking down on a axis and there's rotation around that axis. What you may or may not notice, depending upon how expert you are at looking at these things, is that perpendicular to the axis of rotation, in that direction, there's virtually no infall. But if I turn this thing sideways, you'll notice that the top to bottom are falling in on each other. If you go back to the beginning, you still have the approximate circular shape. But over time, this is collapsing into a more narrow region. This is the same effect that if you take a blob of pizza and throw it up in the air with a spin, it spreads out and eventually you get a disk of pizza. Well, we're getting a disk of a galaxy Again, almost no infall in the direction of rotation. The centrifugal force is keeping things apart. But in the perpendicular direction, after about a billion years, you're getting something that's starting to look like a disk. And if you sort of looked at it from the side, you could get different shaped galaxies that you're going through there. And all you're doing with that particular case is iterating the equation forces cause masses to accelerate each time for each of the 512 clusters in the cluster. And what you're able to explain are complex things that you wouldn't typically do in an introductory physics class, but the physics is the same. There's no reason not to. Now, instead of using forces, we could use energy and try to figure out that if you had a certain number of repulsive charges in a room or in an area where the walls are themselves lined with a repulsive charge, and you heated up the system so that it was a gas, and then using simulated annealing to simulate annealing, you'd eventually go through the liquid phase and eventually end up with the crystal phase. Then if you wanted to ask how stable is this, if you took each of these particles and moved it away with maybe a scanning microscope and then started it up again, you would still get something that would be able to move around And so when you're talking about simulating materials in nanomaterials, you could heat the system up and then it would gradually purify out and go back to the crystalline shape. So what we've talked about is different ways of thinking and again, today, I wanted to emphasize computational science education, where the learning is done computationally. We're not teaching necessarily how to build, how to program, but the concepts that we can teach by running models will empower your students when you get to programming, when you get to model building, to understand sort of the whole list of things of variable names, assignments, randomization, iteration, recursion, controls, conditioning, branching, giants, sword fights, monsters. You know, I mean, there's a tremendous amount that goes into programming that you can approach by first 
running codes that already run, running models in different areas of your particular area of science. The last thing I want to share with you is if you keep, there, there's about half the slides here that were there in, in case we ran out of things to talk about, which I've never had that problem. And that is we've collected a number of objects in what we call computational X for X educators. And these are done with collaborations all over the country. So you would have computational bi biology for biology educators, or you would have computational chemistry for chemistry educators or computational physics for physics educators, computational earth science for earth science educators. And each of these involve collecting simulations, typically ones that can be extended. They're starting, they have curriculum support and you can collaborate with others. And we can change basic ideas of, of simulation. So I, I hope this was sort of, as we promised, an introduction to computational thinking across the curriculum. You've seen examples from several different areas. We did a physics one. We did a couple of ones from chemistry, one from biology, one from ecology. But, but that, that's the idea that there are tremendous resources that weren't there just a few years ago that you don't have to teach everyone to be a programmer to get them to be running programs in your particular course. There are materials that you could bring into the classroom that have already been vetted, have already been tested and make good starting points to motivate your students to want to learn to program if that's one of your objectives. But it's also to give them the dose of reality that often they're gonna be working with programmers. They themselves may not be the programmer, but they need to be able to speak the language. I think that's something that's very effective as well. So we're past our two hour limit of content. There's more things I could talk about, but I'd rather leave everything for questions, comments or concerns on your part. How can we help you? How can we help your colleagues? Okay, let me just end with a couple of announcements, at least from my part. Or were you going to do this part, Aaron? Um, which, which part? Talking about the next webinars and resources and the Google Doc. Yeah, I do have some slides I could show on that if you want. Or... Okay, why don't you do that and then I'll get ready to answer any questions that people have. Okay, sounds good. So I will share my screen here. So uh, we will be holding this webinar again uh, on the 27th of May. So if you have uh, colleagues who might like to attend, they can register on the Exceed user portal. Um, and so we will be holding workshops in June. Each of these workshops is a two-day virtual workshop on Zoom. It'll be from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, June 15 and 16, we'll be covering modeling with spreadsheets more in depth. 22nd and 23rd will be systems modeling, and then 29th and 30th will be agent-based modeling. So if you uh, want to go more in depth on some of the topics we covered today, 
we would invite you to uh, join one or more of these workshops. Uh, there is a two-step registration for these um, where you register both on the Exceed user portal and the National Computational Science Institute website. That's so that we can um, report both to Exceed and to NICSI on who attended. And um, on the NICSI side, it allows you to take surveys so that we can see how the workshop's going as it goes. Um, these will have uh, a limited uh, attendance because of um, they're going to be very uh, hands-on and interactive. Um, and so we're looking for uh, faculty and teachers who will uh, be using this material in your own courses. And so um, if you're interested in kind of taking a more in-depth interactive uh, exploration of some of these topics, we would definitely encourage you to apply to one or more of these workshops. And, and there'll be a modest stipend associated with each. You need to attend both days of any given workshop to, and answer the questionnaires and surveys at the end in order to qualify for the stipend. It's not gonna pay your kids tuition, but it might buy them a dinner. And um, this workshops are only part of what we do in the Exceed Education Program. Um, if you are interested in developing courses or uh, curriculum programs, uh, minor programs, concentrations, majors, um, we do quite a bit of uh, engagement with campuses, working directly with faculty who are looking to integrate computation into their teaching. And um, we also have a, a once yearly collaborative online course where multiple institutions can all host um, an online course simultaneously. So if you are interested in some of these um, opportunities and resources that they are available. We also host a website called hbcuniversity.org where we um, have a list of resources as well as competencies for various computational and data, um, data science topics. Uh, Exceed also offers training in a variety of HPC uh, topics. There's a monthly webcast. Um, lately, it's been all online via Zoom, but uh, once institutions start going back to in-person, um, we do a, a wide area classroom where different institutions can each host a uh, broadcast of the workshop, but have local TAs who can help answer questions within the room. So it's sort of a hybrid type of model. This has been very effective when we've done it in person. Uh, these training events offer badges um, for completion. And um, there's also uh, the materials from these training events are available online. Exceed itself offers a number of different allocations for the various supercomputing centers that are part of Exceed. So if you are looking to use uh, large scale digital resources in courses or even in research, um, there are different levels of access that you can get to these supercomputers. Um, it's very easy to get a startup allocation so that you can get to know how to use the different uh, resources. So these are things like supercomputers, visualization resources, big data machines, um, cloud computing resources, machine learning resources. And you can apply to get education allocations to be able to use them for classes and uh, workshops and other learning opportunities. Um, those are available. If you're interested in engaging with Students and research, particularly undergraduate students, we have a program called Empower, which we run each spring, summer, and fall. 
we provide stipends for students to work on uh, research. Um, and actually it's not just research. Some students work with supporting supercomputing centers that you might have on campus or um, other types of uh, support for the types of things that Exceed does. So this is meant to engage students in the types of work that uh, Exceed staff do with the idea that by helping the students learn this now, they can themselves become uh, Exceed staff or, or uh, have complementary skills to be able to do these things. Um, so we uh, have both mentors and students apply to this program simultaneously. So if you have students in mind and a project that you want to support them with, um, you can apply together. Or if you have students and you'd like them to apply for being matched with uh, a mentor at a different institution or maybe at your institution, we can support that as well. Uh, if you're interested in joining a virtual organization of hundreds of uh, professionals who are all helping support uh, campus computing, um, the Campus Champions Program is a very active network of people who are facilitating research computing. So these would be um, people who are helping other people on their own campus use computing to do research. And uh, like I said, this is a very active community with um, a very active mailing list and multiple meetings throughout the year. If you are interested in Exceed helping you spin up a supercomputer of your own or uh, help with some of the um, software installs or other um, cluster related things on your own campus. There's also the cyber infrastructure resource integration. So these are just some of the um, opportunities that we have through Exceed. If you go to exceed.org, you can find uh, more information about all of these things. And uh, we'll also be um, emailing you links to um, the Google Doc that we shared today. And we are recording this webinar so that you can review the recording. You'll have access to all the slides, all the materials. Um, and there will also be a, a short survey just to let us know how you think it went. And we'd appreciate it if you fill that out as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. And we can Turn it over to questions from the group. Anything we can help with today? No? I think people have Zoom exhaustion. People have been doing so much of, of the Zooming. There was a question in the chat if there's any books that we would recommend. Um, Yes, let me see if I have them here. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the books are not general; they're particular. There are computational chemistry books. There's a survey of computational physics by Landau, that's very good. There is a book called An Introduction to Computational. Let me. I'm going to do the old hold up the book. And I guess we can send these out. So Landau also is the author of a first course in scientific computing, where the focus is on the computing done scientifically. Then he has his survey 
of computational physics. And then uh, Angela Shiflett and her husband, George, wrote a book called An Introduction to Computational Science. And, and that's proving to be very good. There are a library full of books on system modeling that have been coming out because it's such a big area. We'll cover some of that in the June workshop. There's not as much yet in book form on agent-based modeling, but we're gradually getting there. Let me see if I have the Shiflet book here. So this is, this is the Shiflet book, An Introduction to Computational Science. And she covers numerical modeling, spreadsheet modeling, system models, agent models, cellular automata. It's a, it's a pretty hefty volume. This is already the second edition of this. It's from Princeton University Press. So, you know, you, you could look for particular things. One of the learning things that I do with my students, I teach a course called scientific, and I'm sorry, yeah, scientific investigation using computation is that every day they're supposed to come to class with something new they've learned from Googling the word computational and their favorite subjects. So computational economics, computational biology, computational physics, computational chemistry, and going to Google News just to realize how many current event level stories there are about people making breakthroughs in these particular areas. So again, it's, it's at the level of doing science computationally, it's not teaching them how to program. But I, I found that a lot of these students become motivated to want to learn programming as a result of seeing what they can do if they knew it. It's also a book by Steve Gordon, Introduction to Modeling and Simulation with MATLAB and Python. Right. I don't have a copy of that here, unfortunately. I need to get him to send us one just so I can show it to other people. Any other questions? Oh, is that the Steve Gordon book you put there? Yes, I put a link to it in the chat. In the chat, yes. Anything else we can do for you? Okay, well, I look forward to hearing your questions and any comments that you have, any concerns, things we can help you with on an individual basis. Um, I'm gonna put my real email in the chat window. The one on my screen is because I typically am teaching from Wofford in South Carolina. And I use that for my Zoom ID. It works. I mean, I'll, I'll answer email there too, but anything else? Anything else? 
Now, I can't do it with you all, but when I was a professor at Clemson years ago, my students learned to ask questions when they're given the opportunity because my professor response was, well, if you don't have any questions, I do. Pull out a piece of paper, put your name in the upper right-hand corner, and then I would ask them quiz-like questions they would have to turn in. So they learned very quickly. If they didn't have any questions, they better come up with some. Otherwise, there's a quiz. But I can't use that trick with you all. Cool, if you're at Clemson. Yes, I am. Oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah. I was in physics for a while. Okay. Not a I'm long in, while. I'm in material science. Well, we got a new dean who came in and declared that theorists were no better than a zero interest CD. <laughs> Because our grants would never be big enough to bring in the kind of money he wanted. So yeah, I don't know if he I don't know if he succeeded, but he wanted to turn our department from a department of physics to a department of applied physics. I think it's still just physics. Yeah. Well, there was controversy there, so I moved on after a few years and Let's see. Took my zero interest CD and invested it somewhere else. <laughs> well, thank you. This was quite useful. Good. Now, I don't know if you know them, but Steve Stevenson and Dan Warner on our, are on our board. Hey, I don't know them. Steve is in computer science emeritus and Dan is on his way to being emeritus in math. And, and in fact, the name, the name Shodor comes from a student at Clemson. Oh, does it? Yeah. Uh, he needed me to sign his scholarship form testifying he had a B or better average, but he couldn't remember my name, so I couldn't find my office. So he went in and told the secretary, all I remember is that he's short and kind of dorky looking. <laughs> I see. I can see it. Yeah. So we took the first three letters of short and kind of dorky looking. And that's where the name Shodor came from. So it's got very deep Clemson roots. I see. <laughs> it's a little known fact, I guess. <laughs> well, as they used to say, it's well known to those who know it well. I see. Okay. Uh, we don't hide it, you know. We've been doing this since 1994. Uh, I was by that time at the University of Illinois working at the supercomputing center. And the dean there didn't like the fact that our education grants didn't charge on overhead on participant costs. So when I did a dollar of nuclear physics, the university would get a dollar fifty-seven. When I did a dollar of teaching people how to do nuclear physics, they would get a dollar eight. Uh. <laughs> so when I came out of the hospital, having had the twenty-two centimeter tumor pretending to be my left kidney removed. And they told me, well, if it was 10 centimeters, it would have said six months. So good luck. We don't know. Hmm. And uh, I got called down to the dean's office because I had missed a budget meeting on Tuesday when I was in a, I was in surgery. So I said, well, you know, if I've only got six months, why would I want to spend it with you? <laughs> right. So I moved back to North Carolina and started Shodor and okay. we've been here ever since. That's good. And I don't go to budget meetings, which is probably part of the problem Aaron is going to tell me. <laughs> if I went to better more if I went to more budget meetings, we'd have more budget. But we'll see how it goes. 
Well, say hi to everybody at Clemson, including the people that serve 23% butter, fat, ice cream in the dairy sales. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will. <laughs> it's still closed at the moment. Oh, is it? Yeah, I guess we, we're not. Well, we, we're going back to normalcy step by step. So okay. Some some dining is open again, but it's how do you get place. how do you get world famous Clemson blue cheese? It's difficult to get these days. <laughs> I guess some stores have it. I guess so. Good. Well, it's good talking to you. Any anything? Good else? Yeah, good talking hey, to you too. Ada, how are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I was a little late getting back from our break and uh, you had this problem up on the board um, where you were adding, you know, the digits from one through 10 and was, I don't know if that's less than or equal to 55. Could you just briefly go over that again for me? Sure. Because I don't know if that was under quantitative thinking or- It was under quantitative thinking. Okay, could you just right. do that briefly for me? All right, so I have to plug in my iPad because I, I use the iPad pretty extensively when I'm doing Zoom. Okay. All right, so what I did was we had the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And the right. goal was what, how many, not simply what's the answer, but how many different ways could you come up with the answer of what is the sum of the first 10 integers? And the, okay. first, the first person suggested you just add them up. One plus two is three, plus three is six, plus four is 10, plus five is 15, 21, 28, 36, 45, plus 10 is 55. So the right. answer would be 55. And, and you could make a mistake along the way or you could get lost or forget one and students don't seem to want to spend a lot of time. But if you were to do groupings, like what if you did something like one plus 10, how much is that? Okay, you're 11. Two plus nine. Okay, 11. Three plus eight. 11. Four plus seven. 11. Five plus six. Four plus what, six? Five plus six. Yeah. Oh, it's 11 again. So now you have five times 11, which is equal to? 55. 55. So you get the same answer, but there's two completely different ways of getting it. And one requires a lot more computational thinking to get started. The other one is basically brute force. Now, okay. if, if you wanted to, let me see if I can pick a different color. Here's green. What if you left 10 by itself and you did nine plus one? Okay, you're at 10. Two plus eight. Oh, I see. You know, this reminds me of the full method. Okay, let's. Okay, and three, three plus, plus seven, four, four plus six. six. And now you have, plus you've got this 10. So you have five groups of 10 plus five because you never matched up this five. What does that give you? Okay, you have 55 again. Yep. And then when you take advanced math, they tell you, oh, the sum of the first N integers is N times N plus one divided by two. Okay. So if N is equal to 10, that would be 10 times 11 divided by two. Okay. N divided by two gives you five. Times 11 is 55 again. So the idea is that the, it's more important that students realize there's more than one way to solve the problem. You don't have to do it the one way the teacher says there is. Okay, and you did something with the uh, 16 divided by 64. Right. And you That's said one of your students says, well, why not just divide by six? And then you would have one fourth, but that's not true for all. Right, you just cancel the sixes. And this is yes. typical of a problem teachers have where they don't realize that not every kid in the class could be interpreting what they're doing. So if you're standing at the front of the room and you're scratching something out at the top above the horizontal line in the numerator, 
and you scratch something out below the line, how do you make sure your students know that you're canceling factors, not digits? Okay. Because to them, they think they got the right answer. Right. But if you gave and them- And then you went, go ahead. If you gave them another problem, like 12 divided by 24, if you cancel the twos, you don't get one half, you get one fourth. You get one fourth, yes. So their method doesn't work except for that one particular example. Oh, very good. So then I think you came back to the right answer is equal to the wrong answer plus correction. Right. Oh, so okay. Then you have to go back and correct them and say, well, that's not really the right way to do it. Let's go back and think about, and then you discover that they think you're canceling digits when you're supposed to be canceling factors. Okay. Because thank you, know, you so very much. Yeah, it, I mean, if you, you know, if you kind of did this where you said, you know, two times eight divided by eight times eight. That would give you two eighths, and then that'll give you one fourth. It's clear that you're canceling factors, not digits. Right. Okay. But students get confused, and you know, you've got to kind of help them clarify their computational thinking, figure out what they're doing and how they're doing it. Thank you so very much, uh, Bob. I appreciate that. Okay. I actually got a question on okay. maybe even on this example. So my experience is when students hear that there's more than one way to do a problem, they get confused because they want to know the way of doing a problem. So, Philosophically, that's what I call the old way of hundreds of years of education where there was one answer to one question and if you got it right, you were done. Right. But the fact is in, in the computational world, especially when you've got different architectures and different algorithms, you really need to be able to solve the problem and think about it different ways in case one of those is gonna be more computationally compact than others right but so it's, it's a good skill to have is to think about the other is it gives you more certainty that you have the right answer like the 55 problem no matter how you do it you're going to get 55 but there's also sometimes that the algorithms give you different answers and then you have to ask well what is it in the algorithm that's lacking because these things ought to be the same mm -hmm. So for instance, if I gave you a simple example from order of operations, how would you describe what the rule is for order of operations? I would just say that's multiplication and division goes, you know, has priority over addition and subtraction. Right, so you, you have, like some schools teach PEMDAS, parentheses, exponentiation, multiply, divide, add or subtract. And to me, that's the moral equivalent of look both ways before you cross the street. Because okay. it, it turns out in the Western world, <laughs> there's an entirely extra sentence that always gets left out. And that is, and if there are two operations of equal rank, you, you evaluate them left to right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So if you were to take the problem that was pissing off the internet last year. The problem was eight divided by two times two plus two. And uh, let me, so eight divided by two times, two. now, how, what's the answer to that statement, that phrase? What do you do first? What's in parentheses? Uh, so that gives you four, right? 
by uh, so you okay. have eight divided by two times four. Now, if you do it left to right, eight divided by two is four times four is 16. But if you forget that separate part and you were told as I was taught that okay. if, they were, if, if they were of equal rank, you could do them in any order, which meant that it didn't matter whether it's divide or multiply, multiply or divide. If you did it this way, four times two is eight, eight divided by eight is one. So the question is, is the answer 16 or is it one? And you have to do a lot of digging before you can find a book that says, and if there are two operations of equal rank, you evaluate it left to right. It turns out there are a lot of societies that read right to left. Arabic reads right to left. A lot of people evaluate right to left. So in Saudi Arabia, you could get a different answer than you could get in England. Because is it left to right or right to left? And the answer I, I usually give is parentheses are cheap. They cost you nothing. Use as many of them as you need to, to be clear. Okay. But, but you're, you're, you're right, Ulf, that the basic thing, students don't want to know there's more than one way to do it. They want certainty. Right. And unfortunately, it turns out that there's a lot of cases where another way to do it is actually more powerful. And if you have two ways to do it, you can use one to check the other. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what's your approach then to convey that to students? Is it by going by examples or? Usually it's examples and, and trying to not necessarily work as many problems as possible, but to have people understand that there are, there, there's more than one way to solve the problem. Uh, a typical thing is we show two different ways to write the quadratic. You know, you have the AX squared plus BX plus C. And, you know, trying to figure out if you looked at the graph, how would you know what A is? Mm -hmm. If you looked at the graph, how would you know what B is? If you looked at the graph, how would you know what C is? And it turns out that with training, A and C are very easy and B is estimated. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, it, and a lot of that is um, let me see if I can pull up an example of that. So if I share my screen. Oops. So here's, remember our multifunction data flyer? So if, if I said AX squared plus BX plus C, and I change the, the parameters so that they're different. So I have a one, two, and a three. How would you read the value of A off this graph? That's what you ought to be able to do, right? And so you say, well, find the vertex and go over one unit in the X direction. And the amount that you go up or down is exactly equal to A. So the, the interpretation of A is that A is the unit change from the vertex. Do you see where it's one? Mm -hmm. Now, if you come back here and change this to two, and you say, what is the effect of 
changing A in the equation, most of my students will tell you that it moves the vertex. That's the effect. And what they don't tell you is that it makes it more narrow or less narrow in opening. So for instance, if right now we can see that the it's three, but if I find the vertex, go over one unit, I have to go up one, two, three units to get back to the quadratic, then A is equal to three. So once you know what A is, now C is easy because it's just the y-intercept. The question is, how do I know that B is equal to two? And one way to do that is to get rid of the quadratic. And one of the things that you see is that if there is no quadratic, you have the equation of a straight line, 2x plus 3. What's the slope of that line? It's 2. 2. So the answer is when you can only estimate it for most cases, but the value of B is the slope of the tangent line at the y-intercept. Now you can see that if you wanted to, you could estimate that as approximately two. You know, if you sort of figured out that you go over one and you go over one, two, the slope of a straight line that kind of looks like the quadratic would be about two, but it's only an estimate. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a very hard thing for people to do. Now, if instead we wrote the function in vertex form, let me get rid of this. So, and I'm going to again make the three parameters, one, two, and three. In this form, you still get a quadratic. And A is still equal to the unit change from the vertex. I go over one unit, I go up one unit, A is equal to one. But if I change B, physically, what is the value of B? Do you see it's the X coordinate of the vertex? Mm -hmm. And what's the value of K? It's the Y coordinate of the vertex. Now, remember before when we changed A, A would move. Now in this form, the only thing it does is open or close the vertex. The only thing that B does is move it left or right. And the only thing that C does is move it up or down. Now, if the only thing you knew was the AX squared plus BX plus C, do you, I don't know if you noticed, but you can't even see the Y-intercept on this graph. So you can't figure out what B is and you can't figure out what C is but you could figure out what A is because it's the unit change from the vertex. So, I mean, that's just one of the things you said, the more you know, the more powerful you are in being able to interpret data. So when I took all my experimental physics classes as an undergraduate, we always fit the data using the vertex form and then expanded it out to get the, the, the sort of physics form where you have X is equal to X naught plus B naught T plus one half A T squared. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's kind of like where I constantly go back to my students and I, I, I tell them, I'm not gonna tell you whether this is right or wrong. You tell me, how do you know if it's right? Mm -hmm. And 
more often than not, it's right because you solved it more than one way and got the same answer without making any coincidental mistakes. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, you know, it's not easy. I'll, I'll tell you a story from a school visit. I was asked, I was working for many years with the military schools on American bases overseas in England and Germany and Italy and Spain, Iceland. And there was one particular teacher that just wasn't doing very well with her students. And she would spend a lot of time have, giving them homework. And then the way she would check the homework is she would go around the room and have people read out the answers. And if the one person got the right answer, she went on to the next problem. She didn't worry at all about how the problem was done. And there was one particular, and she would always be literally reading the answers from the back of the book. So there was one question which was, name a prime number between 15 and 20. What, what would be your answer? 17th or 19th right well one of the kids when i was observing her class said 17 and she said as she's reading the book wrong the correct answer is answers will vary okay <laughs> you know but the fact that there was more than one right answer really bothered her she says how can there be more than one right answer there must be a problem in the book. But, you know, there are other things that we'll do. We'll, we'll have problems that will be situational. Like, for instance, there's 68 teams that just played the NCAA basketball tournament. If you have the four play-in games and then you have a regular power of two bracket, how many games do you have to play to declare the national champion? And you have kids going, well, there's four games at the beginning, and then there's 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. Yes, that's true, but that's not what I asked. What I asked was total how many games. And if you think about it, out of the 68 teams that go into the tournament, how many teams come out of the tournament as the undefeated champion? One. What do you call everybody else? Run out. <laughs> They're losers. <laughs> okay. How do you get a loser? You play a game. So how many games do you need to generate N minus one losers? N minus one. So there'd be 67 games in the tournament. You don't have to add them up. You know there were 67 games. Well, what if you gave two teams a buy? Doesn't matter, 67 games. Now in baseball, in the, in the college level baseball, the World Series of Baseball in college is double elimination. So you have 16 teams that go into the tournament. One team is the winner. How many games do you have to play to declare the national baseball champion? Where to be eliminated, you have to lose two games. So so out of 16 teams, one's the champion. There are 15 non-champions, each of whom lost two games. Yeah. So how many games do you have to play? 30. Or 31, because the champion yeah, first, could, yes, right. could have lost one game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in that case, the answer is 30 or 31. Mm -hmm. And then I have a student say, well, how do you know which one it is? You play, you play the tournament, you know, yeah. 
how else are you going to do it? But, but, but that's something where some students are attracted to science because it gives them answers that are certain. And then they get nervous about science when you find out that there's more than one way to get that answer. And even more so when you find out that not everybody's in agreement with the answer. Mm -hmm. It depends on what data you have and how, you know, how, right. how you do the experiment. Yeah, and that's especially for computation. I always tell my graduate students that you have to get the right answer for the right reasons. Yes. So we talk about validation and verification. Mm -hmm. One of them is getting the problem right or getting the answer right. And the other one is getting the right answer. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, it gets even worse when you talk about accuracy and precision. Mm -hmm. Because you could be accurate, but not very precise. Or you could be precise, but not very accurate. And so what you're looking for is precision and accuracy. Mm. And that, that's harder. That's why every science paper ends with the sentence, more work needs to be done. <laughs> Send us more money. Thanks for the examples. Those, those are really great. OK. Any other questions or comments? OK, Aaron, I'm thinking if there aren't any other questions or comments or concerns, we can end the discussion and let people go on their Monday. Oh, it's Tuesday. Go on their Tuesday way. Sounds great. Thank you to everybody who joined and hope you have a good rest of the week and we'll talk to you again soon. Please get in touch if you need anything at all.